Hello and welcome to Trends and Dioramas. I'm your host, Ghost of Chatterjee, and today I'll talk about fine detailing in episode 3 of The Barge, my intensive scratch building project. In episode 1, I showed how I turned a plain sheet of styrene and some styrene strips and rods into a detailed miniature vessel. Episode 2 was all about painting and weathering, where I showed a variety of methods to bring that worn out, aged look. Today, in the final leg of my journey with this ugly but adorable barge, I'll show you how I introduced some fine details that added some character to the barge and some story to the scene. So grab a cup of coffee and watch how it all plays out. Now before we start adding the details, here is a quick note. The barge will be sitting about 24 to 30 inches away from the observer, that is 300 to 400 scale feet away. So I'll need some sharp contrast to show the details from that distance while staying true to the overall theme of a typical gloomy waterside scene. I decided to sacrifice most of the details of a real hatch cover since those details will be lost to a person standing 400 scale feet away. I got a couple of HO scale 2x12 by Mount Albert Scale Lumber Company. One piece of this can roughly pass as a hatch board that is 22 inches wide and 3 inches thick in end scale. The wooden strips however were very smooth so I decided to roughen them up. I got a few pieces of 80 and 100 grit sandpapers and started scratching the strips to add some rough wooden texture. The real wooden hatch covers mostly had a very monotonous brown tone. To be prototypically accurate, all I had to do was just paint the strips brown and do some weathering with washes and dry pastel. However, I wanted a slight hint of color to break the gloom, so I decided to go for some generic aged wooden planks with paint peeling effect of a variety of colors, as if they are acquired from various cheap or even free sources. Something that goes well with the story of a small barge operated by a small company struggling to make ends meet. First I painted the wood with a base coat of flat grey and off-white in uneven mix. I took a little bit of both paints at a time and applied randomly. Next I took a small amount of variety of different colors. Olive green, sap green, yellow ochre, raw sienna, burnt umber, Indian red and marine blue. I took a little bit of each paint and brushed on top of the grey. Notice at times I'm dry brushing while other times I'm adding a bit more paint. The idea is to carefully make it as random as possible but mix sensibly so that I get the effect of layers of paints, one paint on top of the other in different colors. Paint takes hold on wood relatively quickly, so after waiting for a few minutes, I took my black and dark green enamel washes from Humbrol and applied on the strip liberally so that it goes into the tiny cracks and crevices and make them prominent. Then before the wash dried completely, I took distilled turpentine oil on a lint-free cloth and rubbed the strip thoroughly. This removed most of the paint on the wood and sometimes even revealed the original wood color and texture giving it an aged and worn out look. Notice that the dominant color is now various shades of grey with just a hint of the rest of the colors, exactly the way I wanted it. Once I was satisfied with the shades, I made a quick jig on a scrap styrene sheet for the length of the planks that I needed, 15.5mm. It was then just a matter of holding the strip in the jig and cut them flush at the mouth. To finish the edges along which the planks were cut, I took multiple tiny planks between a pair of unbroken chopsticks and applied black wash on the unpainted edges. I needed about 50 such planks, but in the assembly line approach, I got them done quickly. Finally, I got 10 highly detailed planks that will be easily visible from a distance. 12 medium contrast ones that are byproducts of the first 10, and lastly, a set of plain grey planks which will be covered either by tarp or by other planks. These were made as quickly as possible. I started with the four hatch. This hatch will be open so I decided to put only four planks at the extreme ends of the combing. I put a little bit of glue on the groove where the planks would sit and then glued them in place. The boards in the front are from the highly detailed bunch 
while that on the back are from the medium detail batch. I decided to show a pile of hatch covers on the deck. For this, first I piled up the generic grey boards on the foredeck. Once the generic ones were all glued, I'd put the detailed, colourful ones on top. Then I moved to the other hatch. Now this hatch would be totally covered, and in the middle, a section of the hatch would be under a tarp that is in the process of removal by a couple of crew members. So I started to put the high contrast detailed hatch boards from one end. After gluing about two to three sets, I started with the generic grey ones, which would go under the tarp. Lastly, I used a few reddish brown boards that looked like the standard wooden hatch covers. These not only brought a very welcome contrast, but also added to the story of the barge, as if they were the only remaining ones from the original set of hatch boards. I couldn't help wondering though how much detail and texture has gone into this little barge so far. I could finally see the finish line. Or was it just a mirage? By now, the hatch details were all complete except the tarp. For this, I picked up a piece of parchment paper. First, I measured how much I'd need and cut the piece using a pair of scissors. Next, I took Humbrol 232, which is sky blue, and Humbrol 233, which is navy blue, in 60-40 proportion and mixed to make a medium blue tone suitable for a tarp. Then I just painted the piece of parchment paper with my paintbrush thoroughly. This would be the top side. For the underside, I wanted a slightly darker tone, so I added a little more Humbrol 233 and then painted that side as well. The slight unevenness of brush strokes made the tarp look more authentic. I'd cut the tarp in half for the two hatches. I started with the covered hatch first. Since the tarp would be shown in the process of being removed by the crew, I just needed a few random folds to simulate that scene. Notice that the two corners of the tarp are a little raised and now we will see why that is. I punched tiny holes in the corners of the tarp, then I pushed a thread through it, pulled it from the other side and tied a knot so that it cannot slip out. Then I secured the thread with a drop of super glue and cut the excess using a pair of scissors. After the threads were attached to the tarp, I took a bit of black wash and applied on them to make them look old and used. Finally, I added some white glue on the underneath of the tarp and glued it in place, mostly covering the grey hatch boards. Since the forehatch is shown to be open, I folded and rolled the other piece of tarp neatly. Then I tied it with rope and tucked it between the two holes. With the hatch details complete, it's time to move on to the next one, tires. I didn't have any ready-made in scale tires, so I decided to make my own using heat shrink tubes. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why I'm holding a blue one in my hand. The reason is, I didn't have a black one of the right size, so I decided to use this and paint it black. I took my old soldering iron that is not used for soldering anymore and started applying heat on the tube till it shrinks all the way to a diameter of 4 to 5 mm. I cut another piece from the tail end and insert the shrunken side in it and applied heat on the second sleeve. This would shrink the second piece and the compression pressure would make it a very snug fit with the first tube and increase its overall thickness. I continued till I got about 3 mm of thick wall on the tube. After the tube cooled down, I started with the beveling you see in the sides of old tires that are out of the wheel for a while. First I used my hobby knife to create the bevel and then I used a conical etching bar to smoothen the surface. The finishing really doesn't have to be perfect, these tires are supposed to be torn and in bad condition. To make some threads, I heated up the tube again with the soldering iron and before it cooled down, I pressed and rolled it hard on my handy carpenter saw file. The fine angular teeth of the file is perfect to emboss threads of suitable size in end scale. Once I was happy with the details, I cut about 2mm of the tube. 
I placed the tire on the tip of a thin skewer and painted it flat black. This is the step that you can skip if you do this with black heat shrink tube, but I didn't have any and was impatient enough not to wait for a new purchase. However, you'll see that this just turned out fine. Once the paint cured, I used some yellow ochre and raw sienna pastel to give it a dirty look. This also took away the shine and highlighted the fine, worn out threads. To tie the tires to the bollards, I needed some rope. So I took some thin thread and made them look dirty by soaking it in the brush cleanup liquid. Once dry, I tied them around the tires and created a loop. Then I took these loops and lassoed them around the bollards. Finally, I took some super glue and applied on the underside and pressed it against the hull for a few seconds to secure the tires in place. Despite all the details that I've added so far, somehow in my eyes these tiny tires just brought this barge to life. It's time to add some human aspect to the model. I needed two people to remove the tarp, so I started looking at the collection of figures that were still not used. I found a model power figure of a person who seems to be pulling some sort of a silver line. The action seems to be right for the scene, but there was no way I could use that figure as is with its silver robe, yellow gloves and shiny white shoes. So it seems that it's time for an end scale figure painting session. I started by removing the silver robe. First, I'd cut the ropes hanging from the figure's hand using a nipper. I used a 1500 grit microfile to smoothen the rough edges. Then I started removing the silver wrap around the figure using my hobby knife. If you're doing this, you need to be careful that the knife never slips and slashes your finger. Once the knife work was done, I continued finishing the surface using my microfile. I got my old friend Dowell and put some blue tack on its head. Then I mounted the figure on the blue tack. I got my Humbrol 155 mat which has a unique greyish green tone and started painting the shirt. To compare it with my trusted Raphael 2x0 brush, I also thought of trying my new Humbrol 000000 brush. That makes it new 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 By the way, if you're into painting figures, don't forget to check my 1 is to 72 scale figure painting videos card appearing on top now. I picked up Humbrol 61 Math next, flesh tone. I started with the hands to hide the yellow gloves. Then I focused on the face. Notice that applying paint on the figure's face brought out so many facial features that were previously not that prominent. So much so, you can see that the features resemble that of an Asian person. I see an opportunity to add an immigrant story to the small society of Wrightsville and I think I'll start painting all my in-scale figures now. In the meantime, I switch to flat black for this person's hair. I'm inclined to call him Mr. Lou. Starting with the rope work, first I'd cut the thread leaving about a centimeter attached to the tarp. Then I'd cut another 10 millimeter long piece from the one that I just separated. In the scene, Mr. Lou is using his right hand to pull the rope and left hand to coil the rope behind him. So the rope between the two hands will have a big downward slack. That's what I handled first. Put a tiny drop of super glue gel at the end of Mr. Lou's hands and then attach the ends of the 10 millimeter piece of thread. Then I took the remaining long piece and glued it to the left hand. It's time for Mr. Lou to go to work. First, I glued the rope attached to the tarp with Mr. Lou's right hand. Once the glue dried, I applied tiny drop of super glue gel on the sole of his shoe and glued the figure on the tarp itself. Note that while gluing the figure, I made sure that there is some tension on the rope that he's pulling. The thread coming through his left hand was then randomly coiled and glued on the surface. I had to modify the figure for the other crew member as well, however, I didn't spend as much time on it as I did on Mr. Lou. I fixed that figure beside Mr. Lou the same way. The two figures definitely add a much needed human connection to the model. Last item to add before the installation on the layout was the actual grain itself. 
As much as my hyper detail obsessed alternate personality wanted me to fill the entire front hold with fine miniature grains, I won that battle by deciding to keep it sensible and introducing a raised platform. First I glued a couple of styrene supports on the sides and then I fixed two styrene boards on them. I used fine sawdust for the grain. Now to hide the white styrene platform I decided to use Humbrol 61 matte again. This is the third time I used this particular color in this project and I used it for very different purposes. A fun experiment really. I also didn't bother about the finesse of my brushwork since no one will actually be seeing any of it. It's nothing more than a deep undercoat just in case there is a tiny gap left somewhere. Once the paint dried, I took an ice cream spoon and filled the hat slowly with sawdust. Used a thin skewer to distribute the material. Once the material was spread on the surface properly, I cleaned the surrounding of straight dust using a brush. Then I took 99% proof isopropyl alcohol and wet the sawdust thoroughly. This is nothing different than ballasting or fixing ground cover, except I have to be careful not to spill it on the painted part since 99% proof alcohol might damage my painted surface. Alcohol is helpful to reduce surface tension of the scenic glue that's coming up next and make it flow better. I thought of using diluted matte medium for scenic glue. I considered matte medium to be a safer option because it will not leave any unwanted shine. I diluted it to 30% by adding water. You might have noticed that the water I added had a slight red tint. This was a poor overlook, but thankfully it didn't do a lot of damage. Then I took a pipette and added the glue to the sawdust. Once done, I left everything to dry overnight. Next day, I did a final cleanup before the big event, installing the barge on the layout. It was time for the little vessel to leave the workbench for good. I did a quick test fit before the final installation. I removed the pneumatic unloader and then placed the barge in place to see how it looks. Once I was satisfied that nothing is missed, I took the barge out to start adding the mooring details. I like doing mooring on my ships the way it's done in the real world. You loop one end and then make consecutive eight loops around the bits. The friction keeps the thread in place and you don't need any glue to fix them in position. Just the way it works in our world. Since there were no bits at the stern, I simply lassoed the rope around the first bollard and then looped it around the second. Given there is not enough friction to hold the thread, here I put a drop of super glue to secure it permanently. Back at the quay, I placed the barge back, this time for final installation. I pulled the threads and moved them around the bollards ashore. It's the end at last. The barge now completes the scene and adds significantly to the story of the Wrightsville port. It's a perfect fit for the slimy, grimy environment of an old port and makes it look complete. I'll still have to finish the water effect around this area and may add a few more tiny details. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook to stay tuned about that progress. This was the most detailed video I've ever done to document a build and I really hope that you enjoyed the series. Looking back, I really like working with the microfiles during the build stage. Weathering rust effect and making aged wood planks was immense fun and customizing N-scale figures was a bit of a challenge that yielded superb results. So what was your favorite part of the series? Which of the techniques were most helpful to you and which ones do you plan to use in your next model making project? Let me know in the comments below. It's time for me to go back to the workbench and start building something new. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know what it is. Until next time, happy modeling.